Good morning. Good morning. All right. I have asked you to be patient for several weeks now. Now is not the time to get impatient. Um, would you go ahead and put the slide up for me? We have been working through uh, Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. And we've kind of, we've, we've covered quite a bit of ground thus far. Uh, we are all the way up to patience. I'm hoping to be done by the end of the year. <laughs> you doubt? Um, but what I've, what I've done is, as a reminder, I've, I've kind of put a, a brief description of the fruits of the Spirit, and, and I told Christy to put it on there, but she didn't, according to Pastor Glenn. Okay? This, this is just kind of the basis from which we have been working from. All right? So we've covered love. This is agape love. This is unconditional. Generated because the giver has chosen to love, not because of anything the receiver has done. See, this is the kind of love that God is calling us to. This is the love that he has. This is the love that he is. And he's asking this of us. He wants us to love, not because you guys did something that I go, aw, I love you. Uh, no, he, he's calling me to love you because that's his nature and he lives inside of me. Conversely, you guys get to do the same with me. You don't get to go, aw, Pastor Glenn, I just love you. No, you got to love me anyway. Okay? you got to love me anyway. Not because of what I've done, but because of choosing to do so. Remember, we love, why? Because he first loved us. Without him loving us, we'd have no concept of, of how to love each other. Okay? So, agape. Joy in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. This far surpasses happiness. Okay? This is based on who we know, who is living inside of us, not what's going on around us. Okay? You want joy in your life, get into the presence of God. Now that's kind of a, a misnomer, that's kind of a misstatement, because you're always in the presence of God, right? I mean, where can you go to escape Him? Somebody said North Dakota. I don't believe it. <laughs> okay? I don't believe it. He visits there. <laughs> but if you are always in the presence of God, why do you not experience joy? I think because you're not acknowledging the presence of God. I think because you're stuck. Your vision is incorrect. You're looking at the wrong things. Okay? Getting in the presence of God really is just acknowledging the presence of God that's already there. Rendering unto God His due. <coughs> okay? Being open with God. Worshiping Him. Walking according to His Spirit. We're, we're going to touch on that in just a minute. So joy. Not based on what's going on around you. Peace. This is something the world cannot give you. Okay? The world cannot give it. The world can't give it. The world doesn't even understand it. They, they, they have no clue. Okay? Peace is not the absence of conflict. It's not the absence of, of chaos going on. It's the absence of chaos going on inside of you, but not around you. Okay? The example of this, the one that jumped out at me in Scripture, is Jesus on the boat in the storm. He's got a pillow, and he's asleep at the back of the boat. And the disciples are despairing even of their lives. We're going to drown. We're going to die. Jesus, don't you care? And what, what does he get? Oh, you poor babies. No, he's, he's man, he, are you, you, you still have so little faith. And he gets up and he rebukes the wind and the waves and the, and the storm calms. Was there peace then? Maybe for the disciples, but Jesus already had peace. 
He wasn't allowing the circumstances around him to dictate whether or not he experienced the peace of God. Okay? So the world can't give it, so don't look to the world to get it. I mean, that's one of the greatest fallacies of our lives. If I can just get past this, then I'll have peace. No, because you know what's on the other side of this? That. Okay? So look for peace in God, not in anything that the world has to offer. Patience. Now this is one that really shocked me when I started studying it. Okay? Because this is a particular Greek word that is used here. Okay? And, and the word has the idea, not just forbearance. Not just, you know, when your, your sibling is going, and you go, I'm being patient today. I'm not going to punch you in the face. <laughs> That's not really what's happening here. Although kind of it is. The idea here is that you have the ability to avenge yourself. To right the wrong being done you. But you choose not to. You choose not to. Okay? When somebody does you an injury, a grievance, you choose not to avenge yourself on that person. It's your choice. Now, we're going to talk, as, as we go through each one, I'll be adding to the list. Um, I've already been looking forward to some of the ones coming up. I'm very excited because some of them, I really, I had no understanding of what what they were and what God was saying should be exhibited in our lives. But there's two things I want to address before we get back to patience. Okay? The first thing is, this is the fruit of the Spirit. So it's the fruit of God living in you. Okay? If you have been saved, if you, if you, if you have been sealed by God's Spirit, then this is the fruit that should be exhibited in your life increasingly, not perfectly. Okay? Some of us are better at some, some of us are better at others, but we should all be increasing in each of these. If you have not this fruit, you have not the Spirit of God. Period. Okay? Now, if you've got little, 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 tiny fruit, you've got the Spirit of God, and you need to grow up. Okay? Man, I got some, some of these that I, I have to really look on the vine to find. I, I tend to stand in front of the one or two that I do well and go, uh, whew, I got it. And then God shows me the other ones and I go, whew, got to work on it. So this is the fruit of God's spirit living in you. Now, the second thing, I told you one of two things. The second thing is, because it's the fruit of God's Spirit, does not give you the right to go, I'm just going to kick back in my lazy boy and let God grow fruit in my life. No, He calls us to apply ourselves to those fruits. How do we do that? Very simply, we're going to read the passage in Galatians and then I'll, I'll answer that question. So if you would, turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 16. I'm going to skip the works of the flesh. Um, we don't need to talk about those right now because those are things that, that are hopefully what we're avoiding. All right? So we're going to start in verse 16. I'm going to skip a couple of verses, uh, 19 through 21. We'll pick back up in 22. So verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And then he goes through and he, he gives us this list of the works of the flesh. Now, something I want to address to you real quickly. These are not all-inclusive lists. These are exemplary lists. These are examples of the things that God does not like, does not want in our lives, and the things God does want in our lives. 
And I think that is borne out by just the reading of Scripture because there are certain things that are not in this list of the flesh that God says He condemns. He despises. And there are certain things that He has called us to that are not put into the, the fruit of the Spirit. Okay? So they're not inclusive. They're all inclusive. They're exemplary. These are examples of what God is looking for in our lives. So jumping down to verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the desires of the flesh with its or crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So, before we get into patience, there's a couple of things I want to point out. First, um, do you notice what Paul says at the very start here? He says, but I say, walk by the Spirit. Now, you understand you have a choice whether to walk or not, right? For the most part. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I get tired of standing and my body just decides we're going to take a step. Mostly that's stumbling. But, but usually you have a choice whether to walk or not, right? Is that your choice? Mm -hmm. um, if I say, Chinese fire drill, everybody get up and change seats. You have to choose to get... I'm not going to do that. <laughs> some of you don't get excited. I saw some of you already starting to move. You have to choose to get up and move, correct? So in this, Paul is telling us, walk. He's saying, choose to do this. Now, you have two voices that are screaming at you all day long. <coughs> you have the voice of the flesh, the carnal nature, this, this evil yuck that you've grown accustomed to your whole life because that's all you knew growing up. And it's the thing that the world and the enemy constantly pitches to you as being the right way to do things. When somebody does you dirty, you do them dirty back. You defend yourself. You promote yourself. You look after number one. And then you have this other voice that speaks to you, I'm not even going to say quietly, because sometimes that voice speaks really loud. Sometimes that voice is like screaming in my ear, don't do that. Like, don't do that. And I go, stop already. We have to choose which one we are going to follow. All right? Now, keep in mind that we have crucified our flesh. That went up on the cross when we came to the cross. Up on the cross it goes. Dead. Buried. It has no power over you except what you give it. Alright? Are you a grave dweller? Do you, do you stand by the grave of your flesh and regret all the things that you've given up? Because if you have, you haven't really understood everything that he's given you. Because everything that you gave up is garbage. It's putrid. It's, it's nasty and disgusting. And everything that he's given you is life. Not, not life like we look at it. I mean, life like he intended it. So, we're going through life and we have this dead man calling out to us. Remember when you used to do this? It was so much fun. And for some reason or another, we have this, this incredible ability to block out what came as a result of doing that. Remember when you used to stay up all night, Friday night drinking? That was so much fun. You went with your friends and, and you drank and you guys had a good time, but you don't remember Saturday. Worshipping the porcelain idol by sticking your head in it. <laughs> You don't remember those things. You don't remember waking up with a 450-pound head. 
<laughs> I, this, I, this, everybody has told me this. I have never experienced this. I had friends in high school, and, and quite honestly, even then, God was gracious to me because I looked at them and thought, you're an idiot. You're stupid. Chugga, 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 chugga. <laughs> that sounds like no fun to me at all. At all. None. But we have an amazing way, our, our, our own sins that are so appealing to us of, of forgetting what comes after them, right? What comes after them? So we have this voice calling out to us, telling us, encouraging us, cajoling us, trying to draw us back into the, the sin, the things that God opposes. And we also have God's Spirit living inside of us that is directing us and guiding us step by step, every moment of the day, telling us what to do. Remember, he said he would be this voice that tells us which way to go, to the right or to the left. He's promised us this. Is God faithful to his promises? Yes. Do you always hear God's voice? No. No, why not? Well, there's a bunch of reasons. Mostly because we're not listening. That's, that's the biggest one in my life. There, there's sometimes, I just choose not to listen. I get caught up in the, the moment. I get caught up in a particular emotion that I'm having, and I choose not to listen. <laughs> Sometimes, I think God is quiet on purpose because he's testing us. He's growing us. He wants us, okay, here's the choice. Do this, and you know it's going to stink. Or do this, and it's going to be good. And the choice is laid before us. And a lot of times I think God just says, and a lot of times we choose wrongly, and he picks us back up and brushes us back off and, and says, all right, remember what I said a couple weeks ago? God's the master of the retest. Mm -hmm. Thank God for that. He's the master of the retest. Because I fail a lot. A lot. And, and as soon as I think I got a hold on something, he gives me another test just to reassure me I don't. <laughs> because it's him that gives me victory, not me. All right? So sometimes he presents those to me and he says, okay, we've been through this before, remember? This one, bad. This one, good. He talks to me simply like that because I don't get complicated with him. This, this one, right? This is, I, this is the one I like? This is the one I wanted to do? Maybe it was this one. Bad, good. Okay. What we have to choose. You have to make a choice every moment, every moment, every moment to walk according to his spirit, okay? Every moment. And it's amazing because, you know, you'll have such victory in some of the tests, and immediately that test will come right back up. Immediately. And, and sometimes that test will go immediately, 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 and, and God's just sitting there going, A, 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 F, A, 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 because we're getting retested, tested, and tested, and tested, and tested. Why? We're stupid. Simply put, we're stupid. We, we choose to embrace things that God doesn't want for us. So, two things I said. One, it is his fruit, him living inside of us, okay, that brings this fruit about. Two, we have a choice whether or not to exhibit that fruit, whether to grow that fruit in ourselves, to allow God to grow that fruit in us. We have to choose moment by moment, step by step, to walk according to the Spirit. Okay? Everybody on the same page? All right. Now, back to patience. Um, the definition is up there. Having the ability to avenge yourself, but refraining from doing so. Uh, I, I read a quote a couple of weeks ago I want to read to you. All who in this world render true service to God or man receive a preparatory training in the school of sorrow. The weightier the trust and the higher the service, the closer is the test and the more severe the discipline. And you think, what, what, what are you saying? <coughs> what, what, this, is, uh, this was written by Ellen White. What she is saying is that to whom much is given, much is required. Mm -hmm. All right? If you want to be used of God, you have to expect that he is going to test the metal in you to refine it and purify it and make it of great worth. Okay? 
you want to be used of God, ask yourself, do I want to be a five-talent servant, a three-talent servant, or a one-talent servant? Do I want to really give everything I've got to be used of God? Because if you choose that, he is going to burn you up in the fire. Because there's a lot of you that is unusable. They're, they're, it's just not good for using. It's like, you know, those, uh, you know, we're coming out of the Christmas season. Remember those little cardboard rolls in the middle of the wrapping paper? Those are great for sword fighting for about 30 seconds. And then they're more like paper whips. But if you needed to move a rock, would that be of any benefit to you? Would you try and lever a rock out of the way with one of those paper rolls? Oh, no, of course. I mean, you wouldn't even really think about that, would you? That would serve no purpose. So what would you use? Well, I'd use my kids. <laughs> you guys do it how you want. We would use a crowbar or, or something, a spud bar or something of value that is going to pry that rock out of the way, right? Well, we're the same way in God's hands. Are you asking God to make you a tool useful and fit for the master's hand? Or are you content being a, a, an article good for ignoble purposes? Do, do you want to be something that God sets up on the shelf and admires and points out to others, including the devil? Hey, have you seen this? Check, check this one out. I mean, that's a scary thought, isn't it? A scary proposition. Do you want to be like Job, who was so righteous before God, who was held in such honor before God, that God called out to Satan and said, Hey, have you beheld my servant Job? Do you want that? So I just finished reading Job again. I love the book of Job. Every time I read it, God opens my eyes to more and more and more. Was God just and what he allowed Job to go through? Well, sure, he's God. And he gets to do whatever he wants. That's part and parcel with being the creator of everything. You get to do with it what you want. Were God's plans for Job good? Did God intend good for Job? Sure he did. Ultimately, that was his plan. Did God have a purpose in allowing the devil to do these things to Job? Ah, you betcha, I think he did. I think he showed him the same thing that he's still showing me. That God is still God whether the times are good or whether the times are bad. Just because our life is going along peachy keen and everything is going well for us does not mean that God is any greater than he is when things stink. When your life is at its worst, God is still great. He is still awesome. And if he were to reveal himself to you in that moment, you would be completely overwhelmed by his splendor. Okay? Now, that's kind of a, it kind of almost sounds like a downer because, oh great, yeah, God's great, but my life stinks. He's going to bring you through it. Because that's, that's the end story of Job. But did, you, but did you notice what happened at the end of Job? Because at the beginning of Job, here's Job going along. Things are great. He's making sacrifices for his children on the outside chance his children sinned. He's got cows and sheep and camels and stuff. And it all gets taken away. And what does Job do? He didn't bring false accusation against God, but he said, Hey, give me an answer. What did I do wrong? I was righteous before you. I looked after the orphans and the widows. The poor were always at my table. I fed them. I clothed them. I took care of them. What did I do wrong? What was he declaring? 
He was declaring his own righteousness, right? Look at me. Look at what I've done. And then his three companions show up, and they start going through, and they start talking to him. And oh, surely you had to do something, because God doesn't strike the, the just. You must have sin. I don't have sin. Listen to me. Listen to me. I don't sin. Well, obviously you sin, Job, because God doesn't do this to non-sinners. The righteous are, are always upheld before God. I haven't sinned. If I've sinned, show me. Where is my sin? Well, obviously you didn't. You, you shunned the orphans and the widows. I've had the orphans and the widows. Well, you didn't look after the poor. They ate at my table. I gave them clothes. Well, you did something. I don't know what I did. God, I want to stand before you. I want to defend myself before you, God. What did I do wrong? Don't do that. Just a piece of advice. Don't do that. Okay? Because what was Job doing wrong? He was looking at his own righteousness and his own standing and expecting God to respond to that. He was holding God to an account. He was trying to take the sovereign God and make him subject to what Job did or didn't do. Well, God, if I do this, you have to respond like that. And then he wants to confront God and defend himself and, and have this trial where God is the prosecutor and he's the defense, but God's also the judge. So you don't want the prosecutor to be the judge because you're going to be found guilty. <coughs> so they go through this whole thing and finally this, this young whippersnapper. I love this. I, I love this. This is like Timothy in the Old Testament. He gets fed up. And he finally says, you know what? I, I, I've given you guys time because you're older. I've been letting age and experience speak wisdom. But, but you guys are stupid. I, you know what? Shut up and let me talk. Hear what I have to say. Which of you is going to bring accusation against God? Which of you can question what he does? Who of you can declare the mind and the heart of God? See, it doesn't matter what you're going through, guys. Whether you're righteous or you're unrighteous, whether you're suffering or you're not suffering, it doesn't matter because ultimately what matters is God and that He is worthy of our worship. <clears throat> End of story. Get it? And I love that right on the heels of that, God speaks. Wow. Okay, Job. And he says this twice to him. Gird yourself like a man. It's like... Put up your dukes. Get ready. Be a man, because here it comes. And then we have chapters of God eliciting his right and his place to do as he wills. Because he's sovereign, right? Does he give a defense of why he put Job through what he did? He doesn't need to defend himself, it's his right. Did he explain to Job, you know, you know, poor baby, I slipped, I made a mistake, I shouldn't have let the devil do this, but I'm going to make it right. You've been good. I mean, he didn't do that either. He didn't have to justify himself because he's already justified. He is just. What does he do? He gets to the end of this and he says, I want you to pray for your three friends. Because they spoke things that were not of me. I want you to pray for them and I will hear your prayer for them. He doesn't tell them, pray for yourself, Job. He says, pray for them. And I will hear your prayer for them. And then what happens? Boy, the end of Job's life was so much better than the first. All of the... the blessings that God had poured out on him, he doubled. Now, is that to say that, you know, we get right with God and we're going to have financial prosperity? Yeah. Maybe. I don't know how God's going to choose to bless you. I, I have no idea whether God's going to bless you with 
a large bank account or a small bank account, really, that's irrelevant. Because in light of what he really wants to bless you with, which is <clears throat> love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all of these things that he wants to bless you with, really, if you have all of those, do you think money's going to matter? Do you really think it's going to have any weight in your life? So let's look at patience. <clears throat> we talked about a couple of examples in the last message. Uh, the, the, the key example that I gave you was the life of Jesus <coughs> being God, humbled himself. He chose, I mean, this is a man who had not only the power and authority to avenge himself, but but the right, because here are sinful people putting him on a cross, subjecting him to the death of a sinner, not just a sinner, but a, a common thief, a murderer, and he was innocent and guiltless, and yet he went to the cross silent, he did not open his mouth, he chose not to avenge himself, why? Because it served a higher purpose. We talked about Joseph and the patience that he showed, especially at the end of his life when he is second over all of Egypt only to Pharaoh himself. And his brothers come begging for grain. They need something to sustain themselves. And he has every right, at the very least, to just say, no, you get nothing. But he could have, think about it, he could have done anything he wanted with them. They were completely in his power. And yet he chose to bless and not curse. There are a couple <coughs> other passages where this usage of the word patience is applied. I'm just going to read through these really quickly. But I want you to get the understanding. Understanding this definition of patience. There, there's two things here. First, let me share this with you. Okay? Um, this word is often used in conjunction with endurance. Patience and endurance. Okay? But patience specifically deals with how we deal with people. Every time this word is used, it's used in reference to dealing with people. And endurance is always with how we are dealing with circumstances. Okay? So when you see patience and endurance, the application is patience is how you're dealing with each other, and endurance is how you're dealing with things, the, the circumstances are going on. Okay? And a lot of times we need both of those because people put us in really bad circumstances, don't they? So, a couple passages that this word is used in. Romans 9, 22 and 23. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. Okay? Do you, you see this statement? It's kind of a, a little bit confusing to read. Let me, let me give you my understanding of this passage. Okay? What Paul is telling us right here is that God suffered people that would never accept him so that he could embrace those that would. Okay? He is dealing patiently with a world that despises and rejects him and hates him. He is withholding his due justice from them in order that those who will receive his mercy and grace might receive it. Do you get that? Because that's important in light of Revelation. Because there will come a time when the storehouse is full, the fields have been harvested, and God will say... It's done. Now is the time for him to pour out the full measure of his justice. Okay? And trust me, you want to be in the storehouse when that happens. Okay? So, that's one example. Uh, Ephesians 4. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, 
bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now, one of the things that I've really been discovering is that all of this fruit that we see listed here, really this is all interpersonal, isn't it? Isn't it? Because all of these things help us deal with each other. Do you know why I think it's the fruit of God's Spirit? I think this is how the Godhead treats with each other. With love. With joy. With peace. With patience. Kindness. And the expectation is that God desires us to be as He is. That's the whole working out of our salvation. That's, that's the whole process of being sanctified, is to become more and more like Him, that He might increase, that I might decrease, right? Less of me, more of Him. So, interpersonally, patience is required in how we deal with each other. Okay? So, Paul is, is encouraging us. This is how we should deal with each other, with humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, which means you don't necessarily need to get your way. Right? Which is more important, that you get your way or that we maintain unity? Are you willing to forego your way? To be united with your brothers and sisters? Is that something you're willing to accept? Colossians. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord forgives you. So you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you are called in one body. <coughs> and be thankful. See, see, see what's going on here? This is all how we are supposed to be acting toward each other. Because there is one body. And there is one spirit. Okay? Uh, 1 Timothy 1.16 says, But I received mercy for this reason. That in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Wow. I mean, this is, this is a guy that wrote the majority of the New Testament. And he's saying, man, God chose me because he wants you to understand how patient he is. Because if he can be patient with me, he can definitely be patient with you. What an example. I mean, you look at the life of Paul. Was God patient with Paul? Think about it. God was patient enough with Paul that he allowed him to put to death a number of his saints. Wow. Kind of puts it in a whole different light, doesn't it? 2 Timothy I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. See, we like this reprove, rebuke, and exhort. That kind of fits in good with where we're at because that's kind of falls into the self-righteousness because if I can rebuke you and reprove you and exhort you, that means that I'm already there and I'm rebuke-proof. I'm not. And, and a number of you have come and rebuked me on certain things and I thank God for you. I think it's important that the body helps correct and hold itself accountable. Okay, because none of us are perfect. We're all making mistakes. But, but did you see how we do that? With complete patience. Not getting fed up. Okay, you know what? This is the fourth time that you failed at this. You're fired. You can no longer be a part of our team. 
Go sit on the bench. We preach the word. We are ready in season and out of season. We rebuke, we reprove, we exhort with complete patience. James tells us as an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Wow, you want to see patience in action? Look at what some of the stuff the prophets had to go through. Look at Jeremiah. Wow. There are two places in the Old Testament where when they wrote the Septuagint, you know what the Septuagint is? It's when they translated the Hebrew into Greek. Okay? It's called the Septuagint because it took 70 some scholars and it took them 70 some days to make the, the first part of the translation done. It was done in Alexandria. They took the Hebrew and they translated it into Greek. And we know that Jesus actually read this at some point because several of the places that he quotes the Old Testament, he actually quotes it from the Septuagint, not from the Hebrew. Okay? So we know that in God's eyes, it was considered a worthy translation. Okay, but there's two places where this word is a word that they chose to render a Hebrew word for patience. I want to give those to you real quick. Uh, the first one is in Proverbs 25, 15. Uh, With patience, a ruler may be persuaded, and a soft tongue will break a bone. How do we deal with each other? With patience. You have the right, you have the ability to avenge yourself, to make it right on your own, but you choose not to. Be patient with one another. One other passage, um, Jeremiah 15, 15. Uh, O Lord, you know, remember me and visit me and take vengeance for me on my persecutors. In your forbearance or in your patience, take me not away. Know that for your sake I bear reproach. Okay? This is God being patient with who? Jeremiah. Okay? This is all interpersonal. This is all how we deal with people and, and often how God deals with us, with patience. So let me encourage you. If you look at the fruit of God's Spirit and you think, there is absolutely no way I can achieve this. You're absolutely right. There's no way you can achieve this. Okay? But patience is one that, that God has been dealing with me for a long time absolutely a long time. I'm getting better. But if I had to do it in and of myself, there's absolutely no way. But I have to choose when that moment is on me, am I going to allow His Spirit free reign in my life? Am I going to follow what His Spirit desires? Or am I going to give in to my flesh? Am I going to be a grave dweller? Am I going to go back and act how I used to do? So in each of these situations, submit yourself to God. Submit yourself to His will. And your life will be so much better. Because you'll find that these things don't affect you as much. Why? Because God's your defender. He's your shield. He's, he's the one that covers you. And when they bring accusation against you, when they bring hard things against you, who do they got to go through to get to you? God. And those injuries that they seek to do to you, they're doing to Him first. That's why it says it is his to avenge and his to repay, not ours. He will take care of it. Why? Because he's been injured before us. Okay? Be patient with each other. Choose to be patient with one another. Father, we bless you today. I thank you, God, that you are patient with us. God, that you choose every day to be patient with us. Father, when we err, when we sin, when we stumble and fall, Father, you are patient. You are there to raise us back up, to set us on our feet, to let us take the retest, to grow more and more into you, more and more like you. Father, I ask that you would help us today to allow your spirit free reign in our lives. 
that you would accomplish what you desire. Father, that we would be holy, that we would be sanctified, that, Father, we would be true representations of you in this dark world. We bless you today, Father. We honor you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.